you are not meditating, praying, open your mouth wide, the Lord said, and I will feel it. Open your mouth and bless the name of the Lord this morning. I appreciate God. Thank Him for His faithfulness. Day by day, night by night, God has been keeping us. We are kept by His power. We are kept by His love. Open your mouth and begin to worship the name of the Lord. God is good to all. Open your mouth and bless the name of the Lord. Show gratitude unto Him, beloved brethren. Let's thank Him. I appreciate this God of heaven. He's a good God. The Bible says God is good to all. It's good to you as an individual. It's good to your family. It's good to the work of your hands. Our God is good. Open your mouth and bless him. Show gratitude unto the Lord this morning. Open your mouth and magnify the name of the Lord. The Bible says enter, enter into his court with praise. Open your mouth and bless him. It says come before his presence with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in your heart. Open your mouth and bless the name of the Lord. We are before our maker. He's the one who makes us. He deserves and is a debt we hold to praise the Lord with all our hearts, to praise the Lord with all our soul. That is what we should be doing as the creature of God to show gratitude unto him, to express our profound gratitude. Thank him for being here this morning again. Thank him for the privilege of worship. Thank him for the privilege of prayer. Open your mouth and worship the name of the Lord. Thank him for the privilege of answers to our prayer. That we pray, not that we pray, and we, are, we don't have the assurance that he will answer. There is assurance within our heart that we have a God in heaven who hears prayer, who answers prayer. Let's open our mouth and bless the name of the Lord. Unto him that answered prayer shall all the flesh come. Worship the name of the Lord for this morning, our worship service. We are in the presence of our Father. We are in the presence of God. Open your mouth for being no ear this morning. Many desire to be here. They are not privileged. That you are here, I appreciate God. It's not by your power. It's not by might. It's by the grace of the Lord. Thank Him because He has prepared something for you in particular. As an individual, God has prepared something for you. As a church, as a whole, God has prepared something for all. Let's open our mouth and bless the name of the Lord. Worship Him. Thank Him for every aspect of today's service. Let's magnify the name of the Lord because God will be glorified. From the beginning of the service to the end of the service, God is going to be glorified. Let's worship Him. Let's magnify the name of the Lord. Let's exalt His holy name. Our God is worthy of our praises. Thank Him because you are here and God is here. Worship the name of the Lord. Bless Him in His sanctuary. Let everything that has breath praise the name of the Lord. Worship his holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Matthew chapter 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and as remained was white as the light. We want to pray this morning. A man requested of Philip, Sir, we want to see Jesus. This morning, we want to open your mouth. We want to see Jesus. In every aspect of the service this morning, in a new way, in a glorified way, in a new dimension, we want to see Jesus. Open your mouth and pray, personalize the prayer. I want to see Jesus in a new way this morning, in a more glorious way. These disciples, they have been following the law, but the God of heaven, Jesus, revealed himself in a way. He never revealed himself to them. We want to pray, we want to see Christ glorified in our midst. Open your mouth and call upon the name of the Lord. You want to pray, I want to pray. We want to see Jesus. We request to see Jesus. In our children's church, they will see Jesus. In our youth church, they will see Jesus. Campus will see Jesus. Mommy and daddies will see Jesus. Let's open our mouth and pray. Request God, we want to see Jesus. Our Savior, we want to see this morning. In every aspect of our service this morning, we want to see Jesus. Let's pray that God will open our eyes, that we will see him in a new dimension. We will see him in a glorified way. Open your mouth. I want to believe you are talking to God. Prayer is talking to God. You are saying something, you are hearing yourself, and God is hearing you. 
pray unto the Lord who want to see Jesus. Request from God that Jesus once again will manifest himself to every worshiper this morning. Every boy, every guy, the Lord himself will show himself unto us this morning. We want to see Jesus. Open your mouth and commit yourself into the hands of the Lord this morning. We want to see Jesus in everything we are doing. Singing, praying, worshiping, we want to see Jesus. Jesus and Jesus alone is sufficient for us. Let's open our mouth and pray. Let's talk to God in prayer. We want to see Jesus. We want to see him glorified in our midst. We want to see him glorified in our worship. We want to see him glorified in our singing. We want to see him glorified in our prayers. Open your mouth and talk to God in prayer that this morning we want to see Jesus. You want to see Jesus? All of us who want to see Jesus in a new way this morning, talk to God in prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Pray and call upon the name of the Lord that we will see Jesus. We will see Jesus glorified in our midst. We will, we will see Jesus honored in our midst. Let's open our mouth and pray and talk to God in prayer. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. We want to commit all the ministers from the pulpit to the pews into the hands of the Lord that everybody will operate under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Let's open our mouth and call upon the name of the Lord that the Spirit of the Lord who is our teacher, the Holy Spirit who is our pastor, Holy Spirit who is our counselor, Holy Spirit who is our evangelist will manifest himself through all various ministers, the ushers, the calling stars, and uh, all security, the electronics, all aspects of workers this morning will be influenced by the Spirit of the Lord. Let's pray the flesh will not take any glory, any part of our ministration this morning. We want to pray unto the God. We want to operate. We want to function under the power of the Holy Spirit, under the influence of the, under the control of the Holy Spirit himself, who is the owner or the director of the church. Let's open our mouth and pray. Holy Spirit will take over. We take over our heart. We take over our thoughts. We take over our mind. Let's pray and call upon the name of this morning, Holy Spirit, take your position. Take your place in our midst this morning. Let's open our mouth and call upon the name of the Lord that the spirit of power, the spirit of life will flow on hinder. This morning, there will be a flow of the Spirit of the Lord. There will be a flow of the presence of the Lord. There will be a flow of the power of the Lord. In every aspect of our service this morning, open your mouth and talk to God, beloved brothers and sisters. Let's pray unto the Lord. Ask and it shall be given. The Bible commands, seek and you will find. Uh, receiving on, is on the ground of asking. Open your mouth and pray. Lord, this morning, the Holy Spirit will possess every minister this morning. Let's open our mouth. Life will flow. Power will flow. The glory of the Lord will be seen in our midst this morning. Let's open our mouth and commit every minister into the hands of the Lord this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. I want to pray for all other worshipers, our brethren who might be on the way coming. We want to pray that the Lord will give them safe journey into this place. Let's open our mouth and pray. No traffic jam on the way. The Lord will clear the road. And the Lord by His Spirit will bring them here safely. Let's open our mouth. Those who are still far back at home, for one reason or the other, they are saying, oh, I don't want to come this morning. I want to pray the Spirit of the Lord will quicken them. All the weariness, all the weakness in their lives, in their heart, in their thought, they want to debar them, hinder them from coming to the presence of the Lord this morning, will be taken away. Let's open our mouth and pray. I want to believe you are praying. I want to believe you are talking to God in prayer. But I pray for all our brethren. Those who are on the way, those who are in, the, in their different cars coming, the Lord will grant each and every one mercy journey into this place this morning. Let's open our mouth and pray for them. Let's pray in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. I want to pray for our Father and the Lord. The Lord will increase him more and more more revelation, more power, more anointing as a minister to us this morning in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and pray. Let's commit our Father and the Lord this morning that as they mount the pulpit, 
We want to pray the Spirit of God, the presence of the Lord, we will possess him entirely. Let's open our mouth and call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord will increase him on every side. Let's pray that through him, power, life will flow to us. The, Jesus said the word that they speak, their spirit and their life. Let's pray unto the Lord this morning that the word that we are going to be hearing, the word of the Lord, the message from the Lord to all, will produce life in every one of us this morning. Will revive all, will resuscitate us, will renew us. Let's pray that we will live here renewed. We will live here after the end of the service revived. We will live here empowered. We will live here equipped, lifted up, then we came in. Let's commit him into the hands of the Lord this morning. The Lord will fill him full, the fullness of heaven. The Lord will fill him full. Let's open our mouth and pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Why are you here this morning? Talk to God in prayer. Why are you here? Why are you here this morning? Any request in your heart? Like Anna, before God this morning, pour your heart unto him. The Lord is hearing you. Any expectation this morning, present yourself before the Lord this morning. God will answer you. He's interested in your prayers. He's interested in everything about your life. What do you want the Lord to do for you? What is your request this morning? What is your desire this morning? Why are you in this worship service this morning? What do you want the Lord to do for you? He's here. He will answer your prayer. In Jesus mighty name we are prayed our father we want to thank you because you are a faithful god we have presented our request before you with assurance in our heart that you have heard us receive our praises in jesus name as we continue the service today father will pray continue with us in jesus mighty name we are prayed we remain standing as we sing together from our gospel hymn and song. We are singing from hymn 189. 189. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to seek. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy. Let him be thy guide. And run not before him. Whatever betide, in joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord. And looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each tem temper beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of law, thou soon shall be fitted for service above.
shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of meeting in your presence this morning. Praying that I hear stand at your feet. Please teach us, you equip us, you will train us, you will develop us, and will make us a fruitful instrument in your hand to be used at all times. In Jesus' name, I pray. Good morning, class. Today we are looking at lesson 106 of our volume 3 of the study scripture. And the topic is purification of the unclean. Can we say it together? Again? Purification of the unclean. Our memory verse. Who can recite our memory verse for us? Can anyone try to recite our memory verse? Any hands? Okay. Our memory verse is taken from Numbers chapter 19, verse 20. And it says, But the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation, because he has defied the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Numbers chapter 19, verse 20. Thank you very much. Can you take our test for us? Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 to 22. Numbers chapter 19, from verse 1 to 22. Numbers 19, from verse 1. And the Lord speak unto Moses and to and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke. And he shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eliezer the prince shall take off her blood with his finger and sprinkle of her, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight, her skin and her flesh, and her blood with her dung shall he burn. Cease, and the prince shall take cedar wood and his soap, and scarlet, and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the prince shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp, and the prince shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water, and bathe his flesh in water, and shall be unclean until the evening. And a man that is unclean shall gather up the arches of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation. It is a purification for sin. Then, and he that gathereth the arches of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening, and it shall be unto the children of Israel and unto the stranger that sojourneth among them for his statue forever. He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with it on the third day. And on the seventh day he shall be, he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead, and purify not himself, defile the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. This is the law. When a man dieth in a tent, all that come into the tent, and all that is in the tent, shall be unclean seven days. Fifteen, and every open vessel 
which has no covering bound upon it is unclean. And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open field, or a dead body, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person, they shall take of the arches of the burnt heifer of purification for sin. And running water shall be put thereto in a vessel. Thank you very much. Today's study, set out on the purification of the unclean. God has chosen Aaron and his own children to be, to be in charge, to bear the iniquity of the people. And God also chose, uh, chose the Levites to be an assistant unto him, to be an assistant unto him. Because God is a holy God. God is a pure God. And he has chosen the Israelites to serve him. He desired that they should serve him in holiness and in righteousness. He doesn't want them to copy or to imitate the nations that surround him. Therefore, he had to give them some laws. He had to enact some laws so as to guide them all through why they sojourn in the land. In the land. Question. What was the purpose of the purification of the purification rites for the children of Israel? For what purpose was the purification rites for the children of Israel? Any hand? Yes. The purpose is that they should remain holy as a prerequisite of abiding presence of the Lord. They should remain holy as a prerequisite. And those that default, of course, they receive punishment. Those who refuse to come into, in, uh, to come in terms with the purification exercise. They were not left alone, but they had to face the penalty and the punishment. Three points we are looking at in this study. Point number one, provision for purification of the unclean. Provision for purification of the unclean. Point number two. Point number two. We look at particulars of a procedure for participation, for purification. Part particulars of a procedure for purification. And before we pray, we look at point number three. The penalty for disobedience and perpetuity of the ordinance. We go to point number one. Provision for purification of the unclean. I open to Numbers chapter 19. I look at verse 1. Numbers chapter 19, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, This is, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord had commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring this, that they bring thee a, a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke, upon which never came yoke. The children of Israel, or the Israelites, God has foresaw the challenges that they will face ahead. And he wants them, he wants them to get ready and to be clean, to be able to overcome those challenges. And he made a provision for them, just like as he made a provision for our own salvation, as we can see in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, I look at verse 8. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Slain from the foundation of the world. We we'll discover that the children of Israel, they are to come with the sacrifice. There are some lessons we need to learn from this place. Number one, 
You see that the people were the one to provide the sacrifice, meaning that we are all individually had to participate to get the blessings of God. Also, we can see the redness of the helper that symbolizes offers of sin, offers of sin that Christ came to die for, pay the price for. And number three, we see the spotlessness of the helper that represents the infinite holiness, spotless of the helper, infinite holiness of Christ, the sinless love of God. And also, we discover that the helper upon which no yoke has been put upon, comparable to Christ, who have no sin, that no yoke was ever put upon him. The symbolic red offer that was to be slaughtered without the camp of Israel is also like Christ, who was crucified outside the, outside the city of Golgotha. Outside the city of Golgotha. The speaking of the bow of the blood on the defiled by the priest also represents branch of the blood of the lamb that was slain. Question. How is the ordinance of the red heifer comparable to Christ's redemptive work? How is it comparable? Any hand from, my, from the middle or the right hand side? Any hand? Yes, any hand? Any hand from the middle or the right hand side? Here yeah, you, can, you can answer. Okay. We can see from here both acts, both of them, they were blood was shed. Blood was shed for both of them. For both acts, the blood was shed. Why the red heifer honestly served as a temporary means. Christ came to sacrifice once and for all in perfection. So there is no more another sacrifice that had to be made anymore between God and humanity. You can look at that is the lamb, I mean the red devil was spotless, was unblemished, was unyoked, meaning that it was clean. The same thing like Christ who was offered for us, Christ remained pure, clean, unyoked, nothing was found in him. Point number two. Particulars of a procedure for purification. The particulars of a, pu a procedure for purification. A look at Numbers chapter 19 again. Numbers chapter 19. Numbers chapter 19. I look at verse 11. Verse 11. He that touched the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days. Shall be unclean seven days. Verse 13. Whosoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purify not himself, defile the tabernacle of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. Verse 14. This is the law. When a man dies in the tent, all that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. Seven days. A dead person was seen as unclean. Was seen as unclean. And anyone that come in contact with a dead body, such a person, they may unclean. The children of Israel, they were required to perform some purification so that they will be able to be able to come to the presence of God, to come to the tabernacle with boldness, with cleanness, with purity. That and that will be done. We look at that of the animal. It take, it take just 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 a day to the evening. Where that of a human being, that of a man, have to take for seven days. And whosoever touch it, that person remain unclean. The question is, are we to abandon our dead people? No, not at all. Not at all. We have to bury our dead people. But we also 
have to take caution of what we do while we go attend burial or funeral ceremony. We should know where we should stop and where we should not, where the area we should not participate. See, why we're talking about don't touch this or don't touch that. Because the moment you touch, the person become, become uh, seen. Because seen, as we see in the Bible, in the scripture, seen is termed as a defilement, a defilement of the body. And once a person goes into sin, automatically it defies and automatically is separated from God. The same thing when a person comes in contact with such, with such a dead body. Why? Sin is a consequence, I mean, death is a consequence of sin. I right, so I Romans chapter 6, verse 26. The wages of sin is death. And in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 5, we tell us we are dead. Uh, sinners are dead in sin. They are dead in sin. And they remain in sin until they come to make themselves right before God. Make themselves right before God. Question. How is the defilement of the body by touching the dead in the Old Testament? The light of the defilement to sin in the New Testament. How is the defilement of the body by touching the dead in the Old Testament? Related to defilement through sin in the New Testament. Any hands? Any hands? Okay. It, by the ritual we carry on in our own time, by some people do the ritual of sleeping with a dead body after the, the person has died. In some culture, but in our own time as believers, we don't do that. Thank you very much. In contact with sin, in the Old Testament, contact with the dead was considered ceremonially impure in the dead. Symbolizes the consequence of sin, whereas an separation from God, similarly, sin in the New Testament represents spiritual death and separation. From God. Can we answer this question as well? Identify and discuss the significance of the ordinance of purification of the unclean to the present day believers. Present day believers. I want answer from my right hand side. I want answer from my right hand side. Yes? Anybody from the right hand side? Anybody? From my right hand side, anybody? From the middle, anybody? From the middle? Anybody from the middle? Okay, from my left hand side, any, anybody who want to give us an answer? From the choir seats, anybody? Okay. Okay. The ordinance, the ordinance, no. The ordinances of the Old Testament, where Christ came, he fulfilled the law and he established a new covenant. A new covenant. That is why today we are not going to make other sacrifices because Christ has offered himself once and for all a perfect sacrifice. So there is no need for anyone to go again to begin to make another sacrifice. And it is important to note that a defied Israelite a defied Israelite is not permitted to purify any other person, to purify any other person until he himself has gone through the purification. Similarly, a defied person is not qualified to offer services in the house of God unto God. He's not qualified because the service is unacceptable, because the sacrifices of a sinner is an abomination in the sight of God, meaning that a sinner Whatever he does in the house of God is not acceptable. A backslider, whatever he does in the house of God is not acceptable. But God requires what a sinner has to do, has to acknowledge. What a backslider has to do, has to acknowledge. He backslid his state and come and return unto God. He acknowledge his sinfulness, confess his sin, ask for pardon, ask for forgiveness. 
make a resolute commitment not to go back to sin anymore. Once you pray and believe Christ, then a sin will be brought it out. Brought it out. Point number three, before we pray now. The penalty for disobedience and perpetuity of the ordinance. The penalty. The penalty. In Numbers chapter 19, I look at verse 20 to 22. Numbers chapter 19, verse 20. But the man that shall be unclean shall not purify himself. That soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he had defied the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation had not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean, and it shall be a perpetual statue unto them that he that sprinkled the water of separation shall wash his clothes, and he that touched the water of separation shall be unclean until even. And whatsoever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and his soul that touches it shall be unclean until evening, until evening. The penalty or refusal to be to be clear. The one decided, I will not, I will not go through the purification. Or a person decide, I will not confess, I will not repent of my sin. That person in the Israelite, the person was excommunicated. The person was completely separated. What about a sinner today? A backslider that does not want to follow the way of salvation. But he wants to follow his own way. Such a person, of course, he already separated himself from the presence of God. Because God cannot accept a sinner into a kingdom to have fellowship with him. A sinner needs to repent so that his fellowship in the house of God will be acceptable. That is why the songwriter says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Must a sinner must allow, a backslider must allow the blood of Jesus to wash clean everything that he does, he does his fellowship with the law. There is a significant fear in the ordinance because the children of Israel were to carry out these ordinances perpetually. That is forever. It's a reminder, a reminder that the demand of God upon us, upon his children, he remains that he remains. Study. The demand for holiness is never compromised. Wherever we are, wherever we be, God's demand for holiness does not, is not compromised in any way, in any form, in any way. That is why the sinner, they need to be cleared from sin. But slider, they need to repent and return before it is too late. Before it is too late. Because there is no repentance in the grave. There is no repentance in the grave. Sin is contagious. Why we should not allow sin in our life? Because one sinner can destroy a multitude of people. That's why we don't allow sin to prevail in our life, to prevail in the church, to prevail in the family. A sin has to be exposed. A sin has to be confessed. A sin has to be dealt with so that the congregation can be clean. So that the congregation service be acceptable unto God. Unto God. The only body that was to remain in the sight to be a sinner. Because there is no place other than hell that is the domination of every sinner. Whether sinner in the church, sinner outside the church, a sinner is a sinner. A sinner is a sinner. That's why we cannot go on sinning. Let's look at this question before we pray now. What is the portion of those who refuse to be clean? What is the portion of those who refuse to be clean? I believe, from my right hand side now, I believe we can answer that. Yes, any hands? Any hands from my own right hand side? Any hands? Any hands? The portion for those who refuse to be cleansed it stated that they will be cast out from the congregation. And today, also, sinners that refuse to accept the offer of salvation given through our Lord Jesus Christ, and they died in their sin, they will be eternally damned. Thank you very much. From the middle here now, I ask this question. Question 
will explain what the blood of Jesus does in the light of sinners and believers. What the blood of Jesus, what does it do? Anybody? Anybody from the middle here? Anybody from the middle? The blood of Jesus, what does it do? In the light, if you are a believer, you should know. What is the blood of Jesus doing for me as a sinner? What does it do in the life of a sinner? Yes, anybody? Fast, fast. The blood of Jesus cleanses the sinner from all sins and purifies the believer's heart and makes him more pure as he is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The blood of Jesus cleanses sinners from all their sins and strengthens the believer, making him to be more stronger and stronger by helping that there is hope that the blood is there available because of the efficacy of the blood of Jesus. Let's rise up as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let's talk to the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and bless your name for this morning. Lord God of heaven, you have taught us. Um, I'm praying that that, that we have this morning, Lord, you will use it, O oh Lord, to bless us, to bless us, to bless our life, and to make us to be stronger and stronger in your kingdom in Jesus' name. Thank you because I know that you have answered. In Jesus' name, I pray. We have just studied from Leviticus chapter 19 on purification from uncleanness. If you have any question on the passage or the teaching, can you please raise up your hand and come. As you raise up your hand, please come to the front so I can see you and give you the opportunity to ask your questions. Okay, assist in the front. Good morning, sir. We, my question is from uncleanliness and uh, defilement. But I would like to lead, uh, read from Numbers chapter 19, from verse 11 and 13. He said, he that toucheth the dead body of a man shall be unclean seven days. Twelve, he shall purify himself with it on the third day. And on the seventh day, he shall be clean. But if the purified not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Then thirteen, whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead, and prefer not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the waters of the of the separation was not sprinkled upon him. He shall be unclean. His uncleanliness is yet upon him. So my question is. Um, this defilement that he's talking about, is it because if somebody touch, touches a, a dead body, does it mean that the person has defiled? And the, um, our teacher said that on a dead body, you have to be cautious. You have to be cautioned. So my, question, my second question, I, 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 if you have to be cautioned, does it mean that, like I used to see, when somebody dies, they will bring everything, can, can I call it environment, bring everything in the stomach, the person will be flat. Can a Christian do that kind of a thing? And again, I said, if Jesus Christ paid it all for us on the cross of Calvary, does it mean that when you now touch somebody, maybe a, a dead body, that you are defiled? So I want to 
No. Thank you. Next person. Good morning, sir. My question, my first question is in respect to our study this morning. So I want to know, the first question is um, chapter 19 of Numbers, verse 11. He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. In verse 13, he also repeats the same thing. Whoever touches the body of anyone who, is died, who has died and does not purify himself, um, defile the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel, shall be unclean, because he, because the waters of purification was not sprinkled on him, he is uh, unclean, lest he is still on him. I want to ask number one, sir, um, what um, is the state of uh, our condition today? As believers, we have been commanded that we should not be able to go contrary to the word of the Lord in terms when it comes to funeral burial, whether we lost our loved ones in the family, our well wishers, and eventually you are called to uh, um, respond to family issues in the family when you lost your loved ones. I want to know, uh, is it right for a Christian to go into a remembrance of burial after a person has been buried and you have done the necessary things for the first time and now after the one year the person has been has been buried two years and the family has decided to call a remembrance for burial again and they've gone back and even does what it has been done in the first burial so is that accepted as a Christian to be to be carried out, that's number one question. Uh, number two question also goes to the sites where, as a, a believer, we have been taught not to do many things contrary to the word of God when we lost our family because unbelievers are many than believers. And now they are giving you pressure not to 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 do some certain things like buying of palm wine, alcoholic and doing some bringing of coal and not. And as a believer, you said you won't do that because you're a Christian. And so what would be the implication if, is it a sin, if you're able to present cash to use for those things to them, not you buying it, but you give out cash as a Christian for them to use and buy that. That's number two question. Finally, this is in deviation a little bit away from what we study. I want to know, as a believer, you were looking for a job, and eventually you have not been able to find a job until mercifully God help you to get a job, and reaching in that organization, and eventually you find out that you receive your first salary. And that believer decided to be going up and down um, because he met a supervisor under him that is working under them. And he just decided to be giving out money in the name of I'm appreciating them. And not that those people were the one that gave him the job. He wasn't the one. They didn't even know him. He only came to get the work and work under them. So, sir, is that a bribe? I want to know, what, do we really, what does that really stand for? If a believer who says there is then to do such a kind of thing, or does that, would that call it a bribe or appreciation, sir? Thank you, God bless you. Thank you for the questions I've been asked. Coming to the question of our sister. In the Old Testament, we see the Lord giving specific instructions to the children of Israel. Some of these laws and many of these laws are for the purpose of preventing diseases coming into their midst. Remember, at this time, they were in the wilderness. Also, remember at this time, there has not been this advancement of mercy, and so people can easily catch any disease and get killed. In order to prevent the lives of the children of Israel, the Lord gave them specific instruction to keep them away 
from diseases that can come upon them as a result of contact with people who have died, and you also know. Recently, we've just gone through the experience of COVID, and we're giving specific instructions. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, so that you don't get infected by that disease. And we're even told that when a person with COVID dies, you just don't go and bury him because of the implication, because of the impact it can have on the people around him. There were rules that are given. In fact, in many cases, they say it's only the government that will come and bury such people because of the things that can affect the life of those around them and the life of those who touch that dead body. In the same way, God was thinking about the head of the children of Israel and gave them specific instructions on what to do and what not to do so that they can remain healthy, so that diseases will not spread in their midst. He gave them the laws that they must keep for their health's sake. And also, as believers, we need to understand that there are some things as well. The Bible says, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. There are some things that may not be wrong, but that don't expedient for us as Christians, that as believers, we need to avoid totally and completely. Now, coming to the dead people you ask, the dead, in the scripture, the Bible tells us that we have just read that when they come in contact with the dead, they become defiled. And in order to be able to stay within the congregation, they have to go through a process of cleansing so as not to put the other people at a disadvantage, so as not to put the other people uh, at risk of the diseases that such people might have caught. Those were the rules given by the Lord to, pre to preserve the lives of the children of Israel. But let's take it further. Those were the things the Lord said in, to the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. But Jesus Christ said something more than that. Something more defiling than that in Mark chapter 7. Mark Chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 21. Or from verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within out of the heart of men, of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness. Deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. In the Old Testament, we are told you touch the dead body, you become defiled. But there the Lord makes us to know clearly that defilement goes beyond that. Any sin that comes into the life of an individual makes him to become defiled before the Lord. And when that defilement is there, he's separated from God. He's cut away from God until when he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and plead for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse him and make him whole. That is the only time he can have relationship with God. That's the only time he can come in contact with God. See, defies man. Not just the dead body alone, as was said in the, old, in the scripture. But then, talking about the present day, as I told you earlier on, at that time, mercy has saw so much advance. Our brother is talking about environment. There are things that are put in place now, medically, that anybody can touch their body, and yet it doesn't affect them. But even you see, the doctors and nurses themselves are also very careful. Many times you go to the hospital, you see gloves in their hands. Because they also realize that there are some diseases that if you are not careful as they work upon that patient, he can contaminate their life and defy their life and make them to become sick. 
we all know those who have HIV and others, we are told that if their blood mixes with the blood of another person, that person is, is in real danger. That's why the doctors and the nurses, when they're in the theater or in the, in the hospital, even when they give, want to give ordinary injection, they put gloves in their hands because they realize that there are some diseases that are very contagious that one has to be very careful from. Now, to our brother, when it comes to barrier, we are talking about people doing second barrier. The question you ask yourself as a Christian is this. Can we find that example in the scripture? Was there any saint that was buried that we have to do second barrier for? Do you hear about that for Abraham? Was that done for Isaac? Was that done for Jacob? Coming to the New Testament, we heard about Stephen dying. Was that done for Stephen? We heard about James dying. Was that done for James? We do not have such example in the scripture. It is a worldly practice that a Christian should not indulge in at all. Because the Bible clearly makes us to know we are not of the world. The practice of the world should not be seen in our lives as believers. We are different in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we don't indulge in worldly practices, in things that the scripture do not permit us. And as a believer, you know this thing is strong. You are not giving them by wine. You are not giving them alcohol because you know it's against the scripture. When you give money to them instead of that, you are, you are in the same class. Your no should be no. You should be very firm on your conviction. I don't buy and I don't give money to people to buy. Trying to give them money is a compromise. And believers should not in any form get involved in any form of compromise. A stand as Christian should be firm and clear to everybody that comes near us, that we are children of God and we are not of the world. And therefore, we stay away from anything that is of the world. Now, to your question that a person got employment, started to give money, and so on, the question you ask ourselves is, what is his motive? What's in his mind? People do certain things well, they do not call it, but they are trying to wet the ground for the future. So that when they need anything, they can easily give them attention. If your motive is that, it is wrong. It is ungodly. It is unrighteous. There is nothing wrong in appreciating.